If the file system breaks the disk into logical fixed size blocks, then there needs to be a way of allocating blocks to files so that the files can be stored on disk. A file can vary in size and therefore can be spread across several blocks. There are several different ways of allocating blocks to files. Here's a list. The forms of file allocation I'll be discussing are contiguous allocation, chained allocation, and two forms of indexed allocation. Here is a visual example of what contiguous allocation looks like. Here is an abstract representation of a disk. The blocks are labeled from 0 up to 26 in a single linear logical array. The fact that they're organized in two dimensions is irrelevant. I also have a file allocation table which will store information about where the files are located on disk. Now, technically, the file allocation table is also stored on disk, though we will not worry about this in this example. So let's say we have a file that starts at block 2 and has a length of 3. We'll call this file A, and as I said, it starts at 2 and has a length of 3. And this is the information required in the table to identify that file on disk. Another file called B could start at block 10 and have a length of 5, and that would look like this. So now we have two separate files. Now files could also be directly adjacent to each other. For example, file C could start at block 15 and have a length of 6, and that would look like this. Keep in mind that the 2D layout of these blocks is irrelevant, and so we simply have a linear sequence going 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 for the blocks of that last file. Now, the nice thing about contiguous allocation is that the blocks are located next to each other on the disk. So the blocks for this one file can be read in quickly in sequence, as could these blocks and could these blocks. So reading the disk is fairly quick. Unfortunately, we have these periods of blank space. That's because sometimes files get removed. So even if you initially start by having each file allocated directly after the previous file and therefore have a very compressed memory, you're eventually going to have gaps as you delete files. In other words, the disk will become fragmented. We saw a similar problem in a previous chapter occur with memory, and the solution is the same. We compact the disk, or defragment it, which pushes all of the blocks to the lower indices in the array, thus creating more space. So for example, if I wanted to create a file with a size of 7, I wouldn't be able to do it in the current disk layout, because we have two contiguous blocks there, one, two, three, four, five contiguous blocks there, and one, two, three, four, five, six contiguous blocks at the end. But we need seven contiguous blocks, so we have to compact first. And that simply means that we push everything back to eliminate the empty space, and the end result of that compaction would be the following. In the compacted disk, all files have been moved to the lower indices, and there are no empty blocks preceding any of the files. So at this point, it would be easy to add a new file starting at block 14 of any length going up to block 26. Of course, this compaction operation is quite expensive, which is a major restriction on using contiguous file allocation. An alternative form of file allocation is chained allocation. Now here is an empty disk, and I'm going to add a file A that starts at block 1 and has a length of 4. But the way it's represented is with a sequence of chain pointers. So for example, I'm starting at block 1, so this block will contain part of the file. However, from that point, there will be a pointer to where the next block of the file is located. And that could, in principle, be anywhere on the disk. 
I'll draw it to block 11. And so the next block of the file is here. That's two blocks. We need two more to get a length of four. And so let's put a block in block 12. And we'll put the final block in block four. Now, given that the disk is empty, there's no reason to allocate the file in this circuitous way, but the fact that we are able to do it is what gives chained allocation its flexibility because I will never need to reorganize the locations of other blocks on the disk to make room for a file using chained allocation. If a free block exists, then this form of allocation can find it and simply designate a pointer to the next block. The downside is that individual files can now become fragmented across the disk, making them costly to look up due to multiple disk accesses being required. In fact, I don't even know that I need block 4 until I've read block 12. So although I could probably easily read blocks 1 through 4 in a single local disk access, I wouldn't have known in advance that I needed 4, and I may not have kept it in the disk buffer. So that's a problem. Despite that, it is convenient to be able to add new blocks of a file anywhere on the disk on demand. And I'll show a few more examples of this just to give a good idea of how this allocation method works. So here's another file B. File B is allocated more or less the way you'd want to allocate new files on the disk. I still have to have all of these chain pointers, but the file is mostly contiguous. The only exception is this hop over block 4. So the chained allocation method will always be able to find empty blocks to allocate to a file no matter where those blocks are located on disk. So we'll never be prevented from making new files. However, there is an op operation we will occasionally do that is somewhat similar to compaction. It is called consolidation. And essentially what it does is it moves all blocks of all files to be contiguously located on the disk. Though not necessary, this is useful for increasing the speed of file lookup. The result of consolidating this disk would be the following. You can see that after consolidation, the two files are contiguous. We have file A starting at 0 and going to 1, then 2, then 3. And file B starts at 4 and goes from there to 5, 6, 7, 8, and then 9. Keeping in mind, of course, that 9 is directly next to 8, despite the way this is drawn. So chained allocation does have an efficiency issue when it comes to looking up blocks. Now, one issue that I mentioned with chained allocation was that we don't know where the next block is until we've read the pointer in the previous block. In fact, if I go back to the non-consolidated version of this disk, we can see once again that the computer does not know that block 4 is needed until block 12 is read. So this creates some inefficiencies. How can we get around this? Well, one approach to address this problem is index allocation. In index allocation, instead of storing pointers in each block to the next block in the sequence, we have special index blocks that store links to all blocks associated with the file. Now there are actually two different forms of index allocation we'll be discussing. The first is block portions. So if I'm using index allocation with block portions and I want to create a file named A, the result might look something like this. The file allocation table indicates that the index block for file A is block 17. If we go to block 17, then we see that block 17 
contains a list of blocks. In this case, 4, 7, 8, 15, and 25. And the index has a pointer to each of those blocks. 4, 7, 8, 15, and 25. So the file can be reconstituted by combining the contents of these blocks in the order that is listed in the index block. A benefit of this over chained allocation is that once the index block 17 has been read into memory, the OS knows where all remaining parts of the file are. This means that the disk can plan to intelligently read all of these files from the disk if need be. However, there is still one inefficiency in this implementation, and that is the fact that these blocks 7 and 8 are right next to each other, but we have two separate pointers, one for 7 and one for 8. The next allocation method we'll discuss gets around this bit of wastefulness. Index allocation using variable length portions allows each portion that is pointed to by the index block to have a variable length. This means contiguous portions of the file can still exist, but only require a single pointer from the index block. An example is the following. For file A, the index block is node 17, right there. And now the index node contains both start blocks and lengths for each of the components of the file. So if we follow this link to block 6, we see that the next 1, 2, 3 there blocks are the first part of the file. The next two blocks of the file start at block 11. So there's a pointer to block 11, and then we have one, two blocks associated with this file. The last three blocks start at block 24, and then we have a length of three there, so we have one, two, three blocks that are the last part of the file. So this approach typically needs fewer pointers. However, we now have to have space in the index node to store the lengths. So there are trade-offs between this approach and using block portions. Another issue in general with both index allocation approaches is that we need to have certain blocks on the disk that are index nodes. These nodes, of course, cannot be used to store file data anymore, so we're giving up a portion of the disk in order to make file access a bit more convenient.